In July 1968, a group of women gathered in a small cottage along Lake Michigan to enjoy an afternoon of playing bridge. The fun, relaxing time was quickly changed by an overwhelming stench, so strong and nauseating that the ladies were unable to continue the game. They contacted the caretaker, who searched until he got to the cabin next door. What he found inside forever changed the small community of Goodhart, Michigan. Join us as we look at this 50 year old case of money and mass murder. July 1968, the small town of Goodhart, Michigan. Sitting along Lake Michigan, this small peaceful community of around 600 people is located in what Michiganders call the Tunnel of Trees, only a short drive from the Straits of Mackinac. If you've never been to this area during the fall months, the scenery is simply breathtaking. It is here, at the Blisswood Resort, that 42-year-old Richard Robeson had his vacation home and was there with his family in their log and stone cottage they called Somerset that he had purchased a decade earlier. With him were his wife Shirley, daughter Susan, and sons Randy, Gary, and Richie. The Robesons were an upper-middle-class family from Lathrop Village in the metro Detroit area and were highly respected in their community. By 1968, Richard owned and operated a highly successful ad agency in the Detroit area called R.C. Robeson & Associates. He was also the publisher of a fine arts magazine called Impresario. Monday, July 22, 1968, was a very hot, humid day in northern Michigan. At the Blisswood Resort, in the cabin next to the Robesons, a group of ladies gathered for a weekly bridge game. The women, all seated around the kitchen table, began to notice a pungent odor each time the breeze kicked up. As the day was unusually hot and humid, all the windows in the cabin were open. This overwhelming stench seemed to be coming from the direction of the Robeson's cabin. The ladies contacted the caretaker, Monty Bliss, thinking it was perhaps a dead animal in the woods and that he could dispose of it. Arriving at the Robeson's cabin, it appeared no one was home. But, it being obvious to him that this was the source of the odor, he jimmied the lock to gain entry. Nothing, and I mean nothing, could have prepared this man for the horrors he found inside. As he entered the cottage, he saw a body, clearly deceased for some time and in an advanced state of decomposition, laying on its stomach on the floor, a plaid blanket covering it from the knees up. There were so many insects inside, he would later describe it as a wall of flies and the smell was unbearable. The caretaker carefully backed out of the cabin and notified the authorities. When the police arrived, they had to resort to wearing gas masks just to enter the cottage. The body the caretaker discovered was determined to be of the wife, 40-year-old Shirley. She had been shot once in the head with a 25 caliber slug. Richard, the patriarch, was found lying on a hallway floor over a hot air register, shot once in the head with a 25 caliber slug. He also had skull fractures, and what was left of his remains did show evidence of blunt force trauma. His son Richie, 19, was found in the northwest bedroom, laying in the doorway with multiple 25 caliber wounds to the head. Gary, 16, was found lying on his back in the northwest bedroom, with two 25 caliber wounds to the head. Randy, 12, was found lying on top of his father, with a lavender-colored rug partially covering his body. He had been killed by a gunshot wound to the head, however no bullet was ever recovered. Susan, 7, was found laying on her back in the hallway, close to her father. She had been killed by a 25 caliber bullet to the face. An autopsy would show she also had a fractured skull, likely from a claw hammer found at the scene. Police started talking to the occupants of the nearby cabins, trying to ascertain the last time any of the Robesons had been seen alive. Shockingly, 
No one had seen anyone from the family in 27 days since June 25th. This, along with the unusually hot season and the fact that the cottage's furnace had been cranked up for who knows how long, would explain the advanced decomposition of the bodies. Police found 22 caliber casings outside the cabin, as well as a bloody claw hammer. So investigators quickly formed the theory that the shooter made entry into the Robeson cabin and slaughtered the entire family with a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol, even using a claw hammer on Richard and Susie. The police believe that the killer placed Shirley's body in such a manner to lead one to believe that she had been sexually assaulted. One set of bloody footprints were found inside the cabin, leading police to believe that they were dealing with a single killer, acting alone. As the entire Robeson family was laid to rest on July 26, 1968 at a cemetery in Royal Oak, Michigan, back in Goodhart, the investigation continued and authorities began looking at Richard's business affairs. Police were able to determine that on the morning of June 25th, the day they believed the murders took place, Richard Robeson had spoken to his banker at the National Bank of Detroit to discuss a pending $200,000 deposit, only to be informed that not only had the deposit not been made, but a large sum of money had been moved from the company bank account. He then called his receptionist, and according to her, Richard was quite irate about the bank account. She said that Richard was quite insistent on speaking to Joseph Scalaro, who was Richard's number two man at the ad company. Scalaro was described as an adept businessman who had studied at Harvard, although he didn't graduate, very energetic, and the consummate salesman. Scalaro was an Army veteran, and it was well known that he was an excellent marksman, who in his spare time was a competitive skeet shooter. Richard suspected Scalaro of moving the money and wanted to confront him as to where it was and why he did it. Once Scalaro was located and put in touch with Richard, they had a fierce argument over the phone, after which Scalaro abruptly left the office at about 10.30 a.m. and was not seen or heard from again until he arrived back at his Birmingham, Michigan home at about 11 p.m. Scalaro quickly became a person of interest in the case, and police immediately sought to question him. When he was located, he could not provide an alibi for the approximate 12 hours he was gone after leaving the office. Police suspected that Scalaro could potentially make the drive from suburban Detroit to Goodhart, carry out the crime, and drive back during those 12 hours. Scalaro's wife told police that June 25th was the only night she could recall in their six years of marriage where Scalaro had not made it home for dinner, or at least called to say he would be late. So. Joseph Scalaro, instead of being a person of interest, is now considered to be the prime suspect. By the second week of the investigation, the Michigan State Police and the Emmett County Sheriff's Department determined that Scalaro owned two guns, a 22 caliber AR-7 Armalite semi-automatic rifle and a 25 caliber Beretta pistol, both matching the types of weapons used to slaughter the Robeson family. Scalaro's family had a private firing range on a property they owned, and authorities were able to obtain some 22 caliber shell casings from this range. These, along with the casings found outside the Robeson cabin, were sent off for ballistic testing and were found to be fired from the same weapon, an exact match. When police asked Scalaro for the rifle for analysis, he told them he didn't have it, as he had given it away the year prior. But, Scalaro's neighbor told authorities that he had personally seen Scalaro with that rifle in hand less than a week before the murders. Thinking that perhaps Scalaro could have disposed of the rifle in Lake Michigan, authorities in Emmett County dragged the lake near the cabin with magnets, but not surprisingly, no weapons were recovered. Digging a little deeper into Scalaro's past, police found out that he had purchased two 25 caliber Berettas on February 2, 1968. Now, in July, Scalaro said that he only had one in his possession, and he had given the other one away. Of course, the pistol that Scalaro did have did not match ballistics from the crime scene. Police knew that the type of 25 caliber bullet used at the cottage in Goodhart was hard to come by. They had been made by the Seiko Company in Finland 
and were only available in Michigan during January and February of 1968 at select locations, and police were able to determine that Scalaro had indeed purchased some of this ammunition while it was available. Police then gave Joseph Scalaro two polygraph examinations, and he failed both. Scalaro volunteered for a third polygraph to save his skin, but that test came back inconclusive. The technician who administered the third test did pick up Scalero's attempts to cheat the test. Looking into Scalero's accounting of Richard's business accounts, police found over $60,000 in funds that could not be accounted for that they believe he had either moved or stolen. They also discovered that Scalero was one of the very few people who knew where Richard's cabin was located. The Robesons were private people, somewhat eccentric, who really didn't want anyone bothering them when they were able to get away up north. It was learned that Scalaro had made the trip up to Goodhart a couple times when it was absolutely necessary to get some last-minute things signed, and it was only for that reason that Scalaro knew of the cabin's whereabouts. Police then learned that Richard had taken out a large insurance policy for the business, totaling over $200,000, where if anything were to happen to Richard, the policy would pay out to the ad company, but more importantly, Joe Scalaro would take over the company. Around this time, police petitioned to get all six Robeson bodies exhumed for further analysis. During the second autopsy on Richard, the medical examiner found an additional 22 caliber bullet in his chest, something that was missed during the first examination. So the official Michigan State Police reconstruction of the crime looks like this. Richard was relaxing in an easy chair, with Randy standing beside him, as Shirley sat in a nearby armchair. The two oldest boys were playing cards at the kitchen table, while Susan played on the living room floor. Scalaro, who approached from the woods, fired his 22 caliber AR-7 Armalite rifle through a window near the front door, striking Richard in the chest. Scalaro then entered the cabin, shooting Shirley, Randy, and Susan as she ran for cover. The two older boys most likely retreated toward the rear bedroom, where a rifle was stored in a closet, but they were both shot before they could reach it. Before fleeing, Scalaro bludgeoned Susan with the claw hammer and then shot each family member in the head with the 25 caliber Beretta pistol. Scalaro then locked the doors covered the bullet holes in the window with cardboard, drew the curtains, and cranked up the heater. He then removed Shirley's clothing from the waist down and positioned her to make it look like a sexual assault. But Scalaro didn't stop there. Police believe he took Shirley's $9,000 diamond ring and a string of pearls, Richard's $700 Omega watch, and $700 in cash that was in the home. Scalaro then left the house and returned to his home in Birmingham. So police took all this evidence, the missing money, the guns, and the absence of an alibi for 12 hours to Emmett County Prosecutor Donald Noggle on December 17, 1969, almost a year and a half after the slayings, alleging that Scalaro killed the Robeson family to cover up his embezzlement activities, as well as cashing in on Richard's rather large insurance policy. But after reviewing the evidence, in February 1970, Noggle decided not to charge Joseph Scalaro with six counts of murder, citing the absence of fingerprints, no witnesses to place Scalaro at the murder scene, and neither of the murder weapons were found in his possession. So, the case went cold. Police had their prime and only suspect, but the local prosecutor declined to file charges. But later on, in 1973, in Oakland County, northwest of Detroit and in the metropolitan area, a prosecutor named L. Brooks Patterson, who announced to the press that he believed the events leading up to the Robeson mass murder had originated in his county, his jurisdiction, and said that he intended to bring charges against Joseph Scalaro for not only the six murders, but for a whole host of other crimes as well. Scalaro, now back in the news, knowing there was a good possibility he was going to jail for the rest of his life, decided to take his own life on March 8, 1973, ironically using his 25 caliber Beretta pistol. In his suit, Scalaro said, I am a liar, 
a cheat, and a phony. In this letter, he listed everyone he had swindled and robbed over the years. On this same sheet, he left a note for his mother, saying that I had nothing to do with the Robesons. I'm a liar, but not a murderer. I'm sick and scared. God and everyone, please forgive me. Despite the mountain of circumstantial evidence against Joseph Scalaro, Michigan state law does not allow an open murder case to be officially closed until it's resolved, meaning someone is tried and convicted. With Scalaro's the case was moved to an inactive but still open status. So will we ever know for sure if Joseph Scalaro butchered an innocent family to keep his financial misdeeds secret? Probably not. But even today, 55 years later, the original investigators are certain that Joseph Scalaro is the guilty party, as they say he had the time, the motive, and the means to carry it out. But some detectives assigned to the case in the years since aren't so sure. They suspect that the neighbors' reports of gunshots around 9 p.m. on June 25, 1968, didn't give Scalaro enough time to make it back to Birmingham by 11 p.m. So did Scalaro have help? Authorities also haven't completely ruled out the caretaker, Monty Bliss. Bliss, who was known around Goodhart as a rather odd fellow, had just lost his son, who was a friend of the Robeson children, two nights before the murders. The next day, Richard had stopped by the Bliss home, gave $20 to Monty's wife, and expressed his regret that the family wouldn't be able to attend the funeral, which reportedly angered Bliss, who allegedly told several people that the Robesons got what they deserved. Was this just small-town gossip, or did perhaps Monty Bliss commit these heinous murders? Could he have helped Joseph Scalaro carry it out? Sadly, we'll probably never know. As for the Robeson's vacation cottage, Somerset as it was called, it was torn down and the remnants hauled away in 1970, reportedly due to the smell of decomposing bodies seeping into the wooden frame. The property itself is sold several times, with many strangers appearing to examine the scene where one of the most brutal crimes in Michigan's history took place. Today, only tall pine trees cover the site where the cottage once sat, and that is all that remains of Somerset. So that's going to do it. As always, if you like this kind of content, hit that like button. And make sure you subscribe and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our content uploads. So, for the Sheldrake Files, thanks for watching, and we'll catch you next time.